Uh, first of all, I understand you had a family background that made you particularly interested in, in veterans, so talk about, talk about that. My dad was um, served, served in the Army, as many people my dad's generation did. Um, my grandparents, my grandfather was a pharmacist for the VA in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I, of course, trained in three VAs, like most of us, and I always felt a connection, but I always felt there was something missing in that I never served. Um, and so uh, when I got called by the Obama administration to ask to come to help, I just felt like, how could I possibly say no? And uh, I want to ask one or two questions about your background before you got to the VA. And uh, mm -hmm. maybe I found one of the more interesting ones was, uh, I remember in, maybe it was in the mid-80s when uh, Bill Kelly, who was running Penn's health care system at the mm -hmm. time, and you were there, uh, announced that we're making a huge push into quality. That was a that was a pretty mm -hmm. new concept that we're going to mm -hmm. focus on quality as a defining feature of this health system. And you were asked to run that, mm -hmm. um, and then you ultimately, I think, became chief medical officer at Penn. Mm -hmm. What was what was your experience in that, and and how do you think the quality movement has played out in academic health systems? And you've run hospitals yeah. that are academic. You've run hospitals that are that are less academic. But there's a lot of hope in the beginning that if we embrace this issue of quality and safety and really took it on, we'd make a big difference. How do you think that's played out? Yeah. Well, I think when I think back to the beginning of my career, I had one thing uh, going for me, and that was my youth and naivety. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I went to Bill Kelly, who was the dean and CEO at Penn, who was not necessarily known for being the nicest guy. And I let him know I was a clinical scholar. And, and I said to him, you've got a real problem. And he looked at me, said, I've got a problem. <laughs> and poor, he said, why you. don't you tell me what you think it is? And I said, well, you're running a very expensive academic medical center. There are cranes all over building things. And there's this thing called managed care coming like a locomotive. And unless you can demonstrate why you're worth all this money, managed care is going to choose for the low co cost option all the time. So he said, well, what would you do about it? So I went and I actually wrote the first job description of a chief medical officer. Mm -hmm. And I said, you need a doctor who understands what's happening in business, but can really quantify the quality that we have and measure it. And he took a look at it and he said, okay, you have the job. <laughs> and um, you know, then I began to really understand that Unless the economics of what you're trying to do, the way you are paid, the way hospitals are paid, is aligned with the product and the outcome, uh, it's going to be a really tough road. So my 10 years as chief medical officer was about trying to find the economic alignment with what we were trying to do in improving quality and outcomes. Do you think you move the needle? Um, the needle in healthcare moves really slowly. Sometimes it's hard to know if the needle's moving mm -hmm. or which direction. Uh, so I think the journey that I started, which was really in the early 90s when you started as well, um, I think we have moved the needle, but a lot slower than I would have hoped for. Okay. Let's get to the VA, and uh, by the way, this is more VA uh, faculty how many, how the many audience people, here. How many people have seen. a VA affiliation? Wow. All right. Okay. Wow. There you go. It's like a town hall for yeah. me. Yeah, it's kind of fun. It's good. And by the way, I'm coming to the VA yeah. tomorrow to talk about the state of the department, so we're going to see a lot of each other. Oh, good. Um, a lot of the book and a lot of your experience over the last three years hinges on this matter of choice. And, and, and so before we get into the particulars of what you try to do, what happened to you, why don't you sort of lay out the arguments? What, what, what is the argument sort of against choice? What are the argument for choice? I know you came down quite in the middle well, and thought there was, yeah. there was a hybrid that, that would work best, but right. sort of lay out the two poles here. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll try to do it succinctly. It's not an easy issue, but the audience probably understands it pretty well. Um, when the Obama administration asked me to come to Washington as undersecretary, um, I hadn't been in a VA in 25 or 30 years, so I, all I knew was what I was reading in the newspapers, that the VA was a mess, it was killing people with wait times, you know, all these disasters. So I came really with an open mind saying, 
maybe I'm going to find a system that's so broken and so dysfunctional that the best thing to do would simply be to help transition veterans to the private sector. I, I, I would have been okay with that, actually, if that's what I found, because uh, I didn't have a perspective on it. And when I came, not only did I not find that the system was broken, but I found that it was doing things that, frankly, I knew you wouldn't be able to find in the private sector. I, I, I was a practicing physician, but a hospital CEO running large health systems all my career in the private sector. I knew if I had a patient as an internist with a behavioral health care issue, even as the CEO, I had trouble getting them seen. I mean, there was just no way we could take nine million veterans and say, good luck, go out and get your behavioral health care issues done, just as one example. So I became a passionate advocate for strengthening the VA, modernizing the VA, saving the system. Frankly, it's what veterans wanted. I thought it was fixable. I practiced in the VA, I mean, so that I felt like I had a basis in reality. Um, and I saw a tremendous system. But I also knew that we were responding in 2014-15 to a unacceptable long wait time issue and that we weren't going to be able to fix it alone so that we had to work with the private sector. The question is when you design a clinical system, how do you keep a strong VA but also allow people who need the care in the private sector to get that? And I created a vision for a hybrid system. I thought it was pretty transparent about it. I published our article describing that integrated approach to care in the New England Journal of Medicine, and I was willing to have people debate it at both the congressional level as well as in the academic communities and, and within the VA itself. And I was on a, on, on a path to doing that. Um, when the people in the Trump administration came in, they essentially said, we don't really want to do that. What we want to do is we just want to get more people out into the private sector because it meets a political ideology that they believed in. And, 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 and you know, even though the press tries to get me to say, well, they were trying to do this for financial reasons because there's big money in companies making money when they got into the private sector, I never saw a financial uh, a financial reason why they were driving this. This was purely political ideology. Government shouldn't be involved in the delivery of services. Government's inherently bureaucratic and poor quality and inefficient. So let's, let's drive things out. So my belief in the choice system was, was that this was a program that when it was going to end in three years, because it started in 14, it was authorized by Congress for three years to 17, we had to find a way to continue to allow veterans to be able to access the private sector and VA to pay for it. So I worked hard to build the choice system in as a permanent approach rather than a year-to-year -year extension into the system. That was part of my belief about how we would take care of veterans in this country. But I really wanted it to be a clinical system that was integrated in with the VA so that the VA could decide, a VA clinician could decide for this particular patient, what's the best thing for them? Can we provide the care in the VA? Does the VA provide the quality care we need? But if not, we have access to the private sector, including right here, mm -hmm. our academic partners. What the um, people who fought me on this said is, is that we don't want that. We want open access. We want the veteran just simply to go wherever they would go and send us the bill. And so that's what passed in the Mission Act. What passed in the Mission Act were what I call administrative rules, which the term is called the access standards. And they are, if your drive time is more than 30 minutes for primary care, or your drive time is more than 60 minutes for, for specialty care, you will have access to the private sector. And in terms of wait times, it was 20 days for primary care and 28 days for specialty care. And my belief is, having done this all my career, 
I don't know any healthcare system that designs its approach on these administrative standards. You design it on the clinical needs of a patient, what's best for them. So if you have a great program at the San Francisco VA that can really care for veterans, that's where a veteran could be. But if you don't have that, or you don't have the capacity, then that patient should be able to go out into the private sector to get their needs met. And so this was a fight that I had about how do you design the system. Ultimately, once I was fired, the non-clinical access standards got approved, and that's where uh, I think that we have to watch what happens very, very carefully, because um, right now, and I know it's reassuring that a lot of people haven't seen large numbers of veterans transferring into the private sector, but I will assure you that's because the system is still being put into place. The third party contractors are still building their networks, getting their contracts in. Well, let me, let me yeah. parrot one additional yes. argument you hear. Yeah. I don't sure. necessarily believe it, but it's, it comes up, which is competition. Yep. Not necessarily one or the other, but by establishing some competition for the VA, you will make the VA better. I'm a strong believer in that. A um, uh, couple months before I left as Secretary of VA, I published an article in the New England Journal saying competition will save the VA. I started to make our data transparent and publish our quality data um, so that you could compare VAs to local community hospitals. Of course, as the people in the VA know, we've always had a system of internal competition where it's the star system. And my argument always was, if I'm a veteran in Detroit, I'm not looking whether I'm gonna get my care at the Detroit VA uh, or the Miami VA or the San Francisco VA. I'm looking at whether I'm gonna to go to Henry Ford or University of Michigan or mm -hmm. you know, a local place. So, so my belief is, and the way that, that the Mission Act does have a component in there, that if the quality of the VA is below the community standard, that would be an indication where a veteran could seek care in the private sector. That makes sense to me because I do believe that we should all be accountable for our results and all have a certain level of competition based on quality. So let's get into the politics a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so you started under Obama. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, why don't you just quickly tell the story how you found out that you were staying under Trump. Um, so, I was a Obama political appointee, um, and on January 20th, one of the sort of very, um, very unusual things that happens in government, when January 20th at noon comes, 4,500 political appointees turn in their letter of resignation and vacate their office by 12 noon, and then Theoretically, 4,500 new employees, political appointees, come in with the new administration. Sometimes it takes time to get through vetting and, and things like that. And so I had my bags packed, um, and I was ready to go. Uh, maybe not psychologically ready, but you know, my wife was coming down to pick up the boxes <laughs> of, in my office. Yeah. And uh, I was getting dressed on the morning of January 11th, in uh, 2017, this was now nine days before the inauguration, and I was listening to TV in the morning, and the reporter said, the president-elect is gonna hold a press conference at 11 o'clock today, um, and um, at the end of her report, she said, and he's likely to announce the new VA secretary. And so I said, if I can, I'd like to watch that. That would be, sure. that would be an, I'd like <laughs> to know who it is. I, you know, I mean, this is important to me that, that, that we get somebody good in there that you know, maybe wants to continue the work that Secretary McDonald was doing. Um, and uh, so, long story short, I, I, I was able to watch that conference, and that's the opening segment of the- announced um, that you were Yeah, in. yeah. What'd you think? And, and, and uh, <clears throat> At first, I was by myself, so at first I thought, what did he say? <laughs> uh, but, but then he kept on saying, and David's gonna be great. And, Dave, so, and then within around 30 seconds, my cell phone rings. And it's Rick Scott, 
the governor of Florida congratulating me. It's nice. I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know. So obviously, other people knew about this, you know. I just so, but but you know, it was the beginning of understanding that the things that we expected, because here's what I expected when President Obama nominated me for undersecretary. They wanted me that day when they were gonna do the announcement at the White House. We had gone over the press statements. They had given me a list of people that I was to call before the announcement, the, the ranking and the uh, majority leaders of both the House and Senate Veterans Affairs Committee so they wouldn't be surprised. They wanted a list of validators from me, a Bob Walker that the New York Times could call and say, so what do you think of this guy? Was it a good nomination? And they had rehearsed what I would do with the press interviews. So it was, it was very, very well thought out. And so I just assumed that's what would happen to anybody else who was, a, this was the secretary position. Yeah. But like, Not you know, exactly. I mean, you know, as you know, this president does things differently. Yeah. Now, one of the things that was striking about the early part of your tenure is, and I don't know your politics, yeah. you were very careful yeah. not to talk about your politics. Yeah. You made clear there were certain things about being in the Trump administration that you thought actually were working better than the Obama administration well, in terms of your ability to get things done in the VA. Yeah, so, you know, I'm sure as you know, Bob, but just so, just so other people know. So in the, in the Trump cabinet, um, I was not only the only one who was from the Obama administration, but I was the only one who had 100 to zero confirmation. I was the only one who had been in their agency before. So I had no learning curve. I knew exactly, I had a plan, and I wanted to carry it out. And so while other people were learning their jobs or figuring out how to destroy their agencies, whatever they were trying to do, <laughs> um, I, I was like, I got things I want to get done. Yeah. And one of the things about this president is he likes to sign stuff. You know, He likes to say, <laughs> I'm getting stuff done, right? I mean, may not always understand exactly what it is, but if you bring him things and you say, look, this is good for veterans, let's do this. He's like, all right, let's do this, you know? And so um, it was a very, very productive time for me. And I'll give, you, I'll give you some examples. And you know, this audience may not necessarily always agree with everything that I did, which is fine. Um, but, uh, and this dates back to sort of our careers in what we think improves quality and what motivates change. One of the big things that I've always believed in besides an economic alignment is um, transparency of data. So when I was undersecretary, I had developed, not, not me personally, but the team under the undersecretary in Washington had developed a public display of wait times. And I really wanted to publish our wait times. I felt that it would first of all show a pretty different picture than most people felt about what we really did. But it would be an accountability mm -hmm. to not only our veterans but to our employees and our, our physicians about how we're performing. And so I had that system ready and the Obama administration would just not let me do it. Why do you think? They felt, and, and, and I'm not talking about, this didn't, this didn't go up to President Obama, so, so I'm talking about people mm -hmm. really, um, you know, at the, the people that were involved in veterans issues at the administration, felt that if we were transparent with data, that the press would simply go to the worst performing VA in the country, the Wyoming VA or something like that with a 100 day wait time, and that would be the front page story and it would embarrass the administration. And you know, I was okay with that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how you get better. That's how you know where the problems are. Uh, but they really felt that this would not be in the interest of the organization that was trying to, you know, walk its way out of a crisis already. It would sort of focus attention in the wrong place. So within a week, of me being secretary, I said, push the button. Now, I didn't even ask mm -hmm. anybody. I just said, look, I understand this may not go the way that I hope it goes, but in fact, um, there was no pushback. 
people appreciated the fact and there were some hospitals not doing as well and some medical centers doing much better. In fact, as you probably know, I've published an article in JAMA about a year ago that showed that VA wait times are actually much better, statistically significantly better than the private sector. Mm -hmm. And, and, and in fact, that's what this data shows. And VA to the day is the only health system in the country that I'm aware of that publishes its wait times, um, except for ED wait time billboards, which are just marketing things. But I still hear when I go and I talk to audiences, oh, those VA wait times are terrible. You know, how could you be making veterans wait that long? And I'm like, try getting an appointment for a primary care doctor in Boston. Or San Francisco. Yeah. 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 Um, one of the other themes of your experience was the emergence of this sort of separate power center in your world of uh, people who came in and were political, quote unquote. Um, I heard you on The Daily on the New York Times yeah. uh, podcast yeah. uh, about a month ago. And they, yeah brought you on to talk about the Ukraine because right. it, it, it felt like your experiences provided some insight as to how one could have the normal channel and then this separate channel. So first of all, talk a little bit about, about Ike and the first time you learned there was this sort of other way that things might happen than the traditional, than, than what you thought the sort of hierarchy was, and then what you came to learn about this separate center of power and its influence on what you were going to be able to do. I'm not sure what I experienced is probably that much different than what happens in almost every administration. Presidents have the people that they rely upon as advisors that don't have traditional government roles, their friends and, and, um, and people that they respect that they pick up the phone and they call. And there's always been political appointees. So the president had a group of people that were his friends, happened to be Mar-a-Lago members, that uh, way before I ever met the president, that had he had asked to help improve the VA. Uh, now, none of them really had any knowledge or expertise in healthcare or healthcare management or, or veterans, but I think that they genuinely wanted to try to help in whatever way that they could. Um, the head of that group you know, runs a comic book company, so you can make your own judgments about that, but you know, I so think. So that was, that was Ike. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, and the political appointees um, saw their job as carrying out what they felt that they were elected to do, which like in many other agencies was take down what they called the deep state or the swamp and replace it with what they felt was something better. Now, uh, the problem is, you know, like in the healthcare bill, uh, you knew that they were against Obamacare, but they never really articulated what they were for. And so that was, that was some of the problem here. But in your case, you knew precisely what they were for. They yeah, were for yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's not a thoughtful level of what the secondary consequences are and how you get there and what the transition is. By the way, um, I am not, and I was never against having open access so that a veteran gets to decide where, if they're gonna go to the VA or not based on competition. My belief was, if you do that all of a sudden, if you make that a political decision, mm -hmm. you will, the consequence of that will, will be that you will literally destroy the VA system because the VA has never been given the tools, the resources, and the legislative ability to truly compete with the private sector. And so what I had hoped is that we would, over a 10-year period of time, begin to start putting VA on the path to truly be competitive, to allow it to be modernized. And let's just take an example. By law, the only way VA is allowed to be paid or the VA is allowed to pay is on a Medicare fee schedule on you know, essentially a fee-for-service mm -hmm. system, where the rest of the private sector is now moving towards being able to do value-based contracting. And, risk-based contracting, and so you have to change the legislation to start allowing VA to be on an equal footing and allow it to compete and allow it to act like it's a payer as well as a provider. So 
All of those things were sort of laid out in a 10-year plan to allow, ultimately, where veterans would have the choice, because I believe in the VA and the people who work in the VA that they will have no problem competing if you give them the right tools and resources and legislative abilities. So, um, but anyway, the political, the, the political appointees, as I describe in my book, um, I believe, um, had a objective, and the means to which they would get to that objective uh, almost justified whatever they did. Mm -hmm. So what I've described and evidence to it, um, that they, they, they simply uh, went outside the bounds of decent behavior to achieve their objective. And part of that objective was they never really wanted me as secretary. They wanted one of their own as secretary. And so let's get him out of the way. And um, for people who think I'm a little bit paranoid, um, you know. I thought so before I read the book. Yeah, I, don't, yeah, I don't anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> they remarkable. would. It's they, remarkable. Well, well, the paranoid thing was, a, was actually a deliberate plant of theirs. They released all the newspapers who was happy to print it that I was so paranoid that I had armed guards outside my office. Well, I will tell you, I was in presidential succession. I had 27 armed guards around me all the time. Every cabinet member does. Always had, ar every secretary has armed guards around them if you're in presidential succession. So, it, but why the press would print that yeah. and then associate it with he's paranoid because he has guys with guns around them, well, you know, that was just normal, every, uh, always had that. Um, but, but in terms of this issue, and I think what Bob's saying because he read the book, is, is that uh, people were coming up to me all the time saying, these guys are out to get you. And my attitude was, I don't have time for this nonsense. I've got a agency to run, let them, they're a bunch of harmless kooks, let them do what they're doing. Until one day, uh, a staff member brings to my deputy secretary a memo that was printed out from their personal email, but left on the copy machine at VA, because that's where you print it out, it acts as a printer. And on this memo was detailed a plan we are going to get rid of the secretary's chief of staff, because she's a Democrat. We are going to next get rid of his deputy secretary, because he, even though he's a Republican, doesn't align with the president's ideology. We are going to get rid of the undersecretary and put in one of our own, and then we're going to get rid of the secretary, and we're going to do it, and they described how they're going to do it. And so when I saw that, I said, well, now it's really hard to ignore this. Mm -hmm. This is a, essentially an overthrow of, of essentially a cabinet secretary. And when you began? But they, they, they followed the plan, and they were pretty successful. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean. Yeah, it got rid of all of us. Right. I mean, if, if you think about yeah. it, they, yeah. they carried out exactly what exactly, they intended exactly to do. Exactly what they yeah. said they were going to do. When you heard the Ukraine stuff begin and the idea of a separate yeah. channel, was yeah. that like, PTSD yeah. was like, now nah, I know exactly no, what this I, I, feels like. Um, I think the thing that's really clear to me is that the behaviors that I saw have been repeated time and time again. So really nothing's changed. I was the first to come out and to describe these behaviors. But as I watched the Ukraine issues, you had a ambassador to the Ukraine who, you know, and again, I'm, I, I'm I work hard not to try to be political. I'm just trying to sort of describe what I think was factual. That I think most Americans who watched saw unbelievably dedicated public servants who took their jobs really seriously and had served this country in the State Department and in the military in, in, in ways that as an American I felt proud about, who were undermined and innuendos and false allegations and back-channel information so that then they get moved out mm -hmm. or they get essentially to the point that they're unable to do their jobs anymore. And to me, um, that's a sad thing for our country because we need people like that. We need 
people who want to do public service, who do it well, who can help the government achieve you know, the goals on behalf of our citizens, and this type of behavior works against that. So I don't want to spend any time on it unless you want to. You know, one of the main mechanisms they use to undermine you is to trump up all this stuff about this Europe trip, mm -hmm. which sounds like it was really essentially made up. You'd gotten permission yeah, for everything. Your sure. wife was legitimately traveling with you. Anything you want to say about that or just leave it there? You know, I think, I think it, it, is, um, it is hard for me to come to terms with the role of the press in this. Because look, I understand you have some unscrupulous people that want to do things, you know, leak false information, and they're going to do what they do. But for the press to participate in this and to just print, you know, it look because it's a good story. It's a good story. It gets headlines, it gets <laughs> clicks, um, you know, drives ratings. I understand that, but um, the facts were in my view, pretty clear, you know, which is secretaries don't do their travel, that they have large staff that do that with approval processes and trips are planned out months ahead of time and not only did VA approve everything, but so did the State Department, and so did the White House, and so there was nothing at all done, but, but, but when you slip out a story to the press and then Somebody prints it, and then everybody prints mm -hmm. it, and then it takes a life of its own. I think I think it undermines um, those that are trying to do public service. I want to do a quick uh, lightning round of things I'd love you to just comment yeah. on briefly. Yeah. Uh, why don't we start with um, being the designated survivor at the State of the Union? Yeah. Um, well, first of all. Um, it was one of my favorite TV shows, yeah, and so, good. <laughs> so, you know, and uh, I'm sitting in my office. This is the first State of the Union address, and uh, the phone's ringing in my office. And I pick up the phone, and there's nobody there, but the phone's still ringing. And then I realize it's not my phone. There's some phone off in the <laughs> corner, which I had never seen. So I walk over to it, and I pick it up, and it's a special hotline to the White House. No one told me. <laughs> that. So they said, you know, we'd like you to be the designated survivor. You can't tell anybody. Um, you have to um, make sure that everybody believes that you're going to the State of the Union. In fact, we will not tell the other people in the White House that it's you until about 20 minutes before. So, so, so my security team and my office were all prepared for me to go and my family they said, we'll see you tonight as you're walking in. And, and then about uh, 6 o'clock that evening, my secretary comes in and goes, there are 20 Secret Service agents outside who want you to go with them onto a helicopter. And I was like, OK, I know. <laughs> but but uh, so, so it, it was actually an incredible experience of which I can't talk about a lot of details. But um, suffice it to say, I watched um, the State of the Union pretty far underground somewhere. Mm. And uh, I did it with about 4,000 people. Um, the seriousness in which the government takes the continuity of government, should something happen to us, I think made me feel very proud. Mm. That people really are there, that they know how this government will continue, they take their job seriously, and it would have been, God forbid something like that happens, it would have been almost an instantaneous full government running so that we wouldn't be disrupted. So I think you know most people here will never see that, uh, but they should have confidence that there are people taking that very I seriously. I think you would have been a great president, at, at, yeah. least, yeah. as as, <laughs> at least as good as Kiefer Sutherland, I think. Yes. Uh, the Charlottesville News Conference. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I had made a decision um, fairly almost from the day I went into government that um, I didn't have political aspirations. I wasn't doing this because um, it paid well or anything else. I was doing it out of a belief that our veterans really deserved better than I thought I was seeing. And uh, 
I had decided that I was going to have principles I believed in, and if that ended up resulting in me um, getting fired or being asked to leave, I would be okay with that. What I wouldn't be okay with was trying to bend my principles because I felt like I wanted to keep my job. So, uh, and there were several times that this happened, but when Charlottesville happened, I happened to be with the president, literally as it was happening. He was at his golf club in Bedminster. I had gone up to join him for signing of a bill, the GI uh, bill, and it was just literally me and him. It was sort of weird. There were no aides around. I mean, he had Secret Service, but there was no staff around. And uh, Char he's, he said to me, he was playing golf, of course, and uh, he said to me, David, what's going on in Charlottesville? And I'm like, what are you asking me for? <laughs> and uh, so I was watching it on TV. So I said, Mr. President, it doesn't look good. Um, looks like this is getting out of control. And uh, then we went out and we did our, our bill signing. And the press wasn't asking questions about the bill. They were asking questions about Charlottesville. And I was pretty uncomfortable with the way that the president was responding and the White House's response to that issue. And uh, I decided I needed to speak out. And I called my family and I said, um, I'm gonna speak out on what I think is happening in Charlottesville and I just need you to be prepared. This is probably gonna be my last day and I could live with that. And my daughter said to me, um, in fact, if you don't do that, if you don't speak out, then we haven't learned anything about our history and I couldn't live with that. So uh, I had my family's support, which was important. And I went to, it's very interesting, I was watching this morning actually about the fact that it's been 100 days without a press briefing, right? Uh, but when I was there, the podiums were open and I could just walk up to the podium and all the cameras would turn on, sort of like this, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, very, very and, similar. Uh, right. <laughs> and, I could say whatever I wanted, and I used that a bunch of times. So I walked up, and I said, um, I want to talk about the GI Bill. Now, I knew that the press didn't care about the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. So the very next question was, so what do you think about Charlottesville? And I said, look, uh, I'm not speaking for the president. I'm speaking as a citizen and as a member of the cabinet. I think it's outrageous. I think we have to stand up against white supremacists and neo-Nazis, and if we don't, it's, you know, this is what our veterans in World War II fought against, and these are the values of this country, and, we, and, and it's unacceptable to stay silent on this. And, you know, either the president wasn't watching TV that day, <laughs> or, you know, but, but um, no, there were people in the White House press office that were very unhappy with me, mm -hmm. but I didn't get fired that day. Right. I'm going to ask a couple more, then we'll open it up. Yeah. Um, I have to ask about Cerner. So that was, I think, your call, right, to say yeah. that we yeah. can't run a software company and uh, we are going to bring in a, a, yeah. a vendor-built system. So what led to that yeah. call? Well, you know, um, if you if you date back about the issue that the Department of Defense and VA's medical records have never been fully interchangeable, interoperable. It actually is a 20 year history of congressional hearings and people calling to do this. And again, in the Obama administration, this was a very active debate. And I sat as undersecretary in lots of hours of committee meetings, and I was pretty sure that nothing would ever get decided. And by not getting anything decided, it's like the San Francisco VA being rebuilt, right? Lots of discussion. We're gonna move it, we're not gonna move it, we're gonna, we're gonna build a new research building, but we're not gonna allocate the right amount of money, years pass, and you still live with a building and a facility that frankly, we all know we can do better. So when I became secretary, I said, I'm not doing this. I'm not going into endless discussions. And I undertook a process that had never been done before at VA, only twice before in government, called the determination of findings which was, I decided this myself. In fact, there were only six people in VA who had assigned confidentiality statements that they even knew that I was 
looking at this issue and that I would make a determination because I was not willing to go into endless committee meetings. I was not willing to go into vendors uh, competing for RFPs and then protesting contracts and all that stuff. So I looked at all of the data myself and I'm talking about telephone books full binders full of data and I ultimately decided that I needed to create a system that was interoperable with the DOD because it impacted the lives of veterans, that this was a public safety issue. And when I came out with the decision, Cerner had no idea. Um, I called the president of Cerner that day and I said, I just want to tell you in one hour I'm going to be making a press release saying I'm going to be awarding us the ability to enter into a contract with you. And they were very surprised about it. Um, but <laughs> I did it very deliberately. First thing that happened is I was sued. I was sued by Meditech, a competitor who makes an EMR. And the judge took a look at the way which I made this decision with data and threw the case out. And so all that did was it gave us the ability to skip over years of what I believe would have been uh, meeting after meeting, committees after committees where we wouldn't have gotten anywhere, it gave us the ability to enter negotiations for a direct contract. And then it took us a year to essentially enter into a contract with Cerner, which, which is now being implemented. Um, but um, it, was, it was extremely controversial. There were a lot of people that were very upset about it. By the way, I use Vista. I like it a lot. I think it was a very good system, but I will tell you the cost to update and to modernize the system was 17 to 20 billion dollars. We could not hire the software programmers in months to be able to keep up with it. The system was literally falling apart, and my fear is if we didn't do something, people were going to end up getting hurt. Mm -hmm. Maybe my last question, we'll open it up for a few minutes. Um, I finished the book not being 100% sure what you think about President Trump. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I was 100% sure what you felt about your experience yeah. and the political people who were undermining you, and yet I came out with yeah. a little bit unsure whether you thought he didn't really understand fully what was going on in his watch, that he actually has some significant political skills, and you, you gave a few examples of where those were clear. Uh, it, it wasn't obvious whether you thought he was really the puppeteer and running all this or he was a little bit out of the loop and there were a lot of things done in his name that were pretty, uh, pretty sordid. Where do you stand on that? Well, um, um, you know, that was, that was somewhat deliberate. I, I guess um, that. <laughs> and, you know, we are living in a very divisive country, maybe not in San Francisco or the East Coast but you go to other parts of the country and people that care deeply about veterans also are very, very strong supporters of the president. And I just didn't believe that it was going to help us care for veterans by me becoming political and sharing my views on things. And in fact, when I left and I was fired, uh, several members of the Senate and Congress uh, held a reception for me, and Senator Tester, who is our ranking Democrat in the Veterans Affairs Committee, stood up and said, um, you know, I've worked with David for over three years, and I couldn't tell you today whether he's a Democrat or Republican, and I said, perfect. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what I always, you know, sought to do. The, the you know, what I've said about the president is, is that, um, you know, Unfortunately, with this division in our country, and I'm sure we even have it in this room to some extent, um, people expect that everything that he does is either great if you're a tr really pro, you know, right-wing supporter, or everything he does is really, really awful if you're a progressive. And the truth is, is that in his style, which is not analytic, not really thinking through a lot of things. He's a, he believes that he knows the right thing and he makes a lot of gut decisions. There are going to be good decisions when you do that and there are gonna be some bad decisions. So I think you get a pretty mixed bag. 
on veterans issues since, and I think you saw some of this in the, in the video, he had a lot of confidence in me. And so he really let me drive a lot of the policies and we got 11 major bills through in my first year as secretary. Um, so I happen to think that that style actually worked well for VA and for veterans and that's what it was about. It was also that same style that ultimately led to these people with influence being able to cause the type of chaos that now we've seen 18 members of the cabinet come and go. Mm -hmm. Unprecedented level of change. And you know, just for the people in the VA, just to give you a sense, my position as undersecretary, where um, I left that position when I became secretary in February of 2017, right, is still unfilled. There is not a Senate confirmed undersecretary. That is the CEO position of VHA. Yeah. yeah. And so this con this lack of continuity, the constant turnover, it creates a place where career people say, you know, I I'm just going to wait it out because, you know, there's nobody there who's got my back. Um, and so, so I think that the president's style um, has some good parts to it and some parts that are pretty concerning about this is the way we're running government. Great. We'll open it up for time for a couple of questions or comments. I remember about oh, 15 or 20 years or so, there was a big push for technology assessment and phased introduction of new technologies in the VA system. I remember Ken Kaiser, who was sure. the chief medical officer who was pushing that. It seems to me that there is less of that now yep. in the VA. Can you tell, tell us why? Yeah. Well, first of all, when, when um, I was undersecretary, uh, I, would, I, I would play a game with, with people who've been in the VA a long time. And I'd bring them up on stage and I'd say, look, if we were a public company, what year was our stock price the highest? And inevitably, long timers in the VA will always say it was the early 90s when Ken Kaiser was undersecretary. Because he created a sense of innovation and he created a focus on safety and he, and, and, and he really had people feeling proud that they worked in the VA. Um, and I used to say, most people think he's still undersecretary, you know, because, you know <laughs> 20 years ago. Yeah, exactly. Um, but what's happened is, is that there is no incentive for people who are career VA people, I'm not talking about the physicians and nurses, I'm talking about the administrators, to take risk and to make decisions. And so the status quo does tend to stay and it's hard to get innovation unless you have a leader who's willing to take the cover for you. So Ken Kaiser was one of those leaders who was willing to say, you know, most people were trying to kill Vista when it was underground and the doctors were doing it secretly. Ken Kaiser came out and said, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand behind this, we're gonna do it. And that's why v VA had the first major EMR. And I was doing that too. I was saying, listen, I'm going to take the heat. We're going to do innovation. So I created new centers to allow technology to come in quicker. We have a center called the Center for Compassionate Innovation, where it doesn't have to have the rigor and the science. If there's a ability to help veterans by being on the cutting edge and innovative, I wanted to create a pathway to do that quicker. So unless you have a leader, and I'm talking about somebody probably either Washington-based or a local-based medical center director who's willing to say, if, if this is a problem, I'm going to take the fall, um, it's really hard to see this happen in the VA right now. Take one or two more. Yeah. My name's Laura Perry. I'm a geriatrician and a former chief resident from the Washington DC VA. Yeah. That was under a big uh, investigation right. during your tenure. Right. I was hoping you could speak a little bit about sort of um, what happened there and specifically whether you think that the conditions are ripe for similar issues to arise in the future in other VA medical centers or if you have hope that that kind of 
um, problem has been eradicated. Well, what, what do you think? What do you think the problem at the Washington D.C. VA was? So during my tenure, we um, we particularly noted that despite having many of us be whistleblowers, um, talking about the okay. conditions of inadequate human resources and terrible inventory management, right. no one was listening. Right. And there were years and years of reports that went unheeded right. um, until finally someone right. started paying attention. And a so, lives were lost as yeah, a result. Yeah, yeah, um, Well, I think you said the problem accurately, which is that there were problems that people knew about and leadership wasn't listening. And that's why when I learned about the conditions, I fired the VA medical center director. Now, I actually, if you read the book, I had to fire him a couple times. Mm -hmm. yeah. because, <laughs> because this is what happened. I fired him the first time, and the Merit System Protection Board judges brought him back and then put him back in. <clears throat> and so then I got the law changed, and I fired him again. And then, he sued, and now he was reinstated. So, so and you so also tell you tell the story. The you tell the story of the person who ran, who uh, ran the get, drove the getaway car for a bank heist and could right. not be fired. Right, right, right. So how do you, and, how do you do and that? And the psychiatrist who was watching pornography with his, you know, in the patient exam room. And I couldn't fire him because it wasn't child pornography. If it was child pornography, that would have been a felony, but adult pornography isn't, so we couldn't. So I got the law changed to be able to do some of that. But, but you know, I, I, I don't think, you know, look, I've run private hospitals, you know. Um, it's not that easy. Yeah, and, and, and <clears throat> you often do have the wrong leaders. The Washington, D.C., VA, was led, I'm sure you know who it was, by a person who was really, really strong with external communication. He represented the community well. He was a African-American leader. We don't have many of those. And he was extraordinary at community relations. And as we learned, he just wasn't paying attention to things that, frankly, are just outrageous, like when surgeons have to stop procedures because they don't have the equipment. To me, that's like, you know, a, it's like flying an airplane without gasoline. You know, you just can't do that stuff. So, so um, you know, we needed new leadership there. And, um, you know, I, I, I think um, this is where it's important that whistleblowers do feel safe in coming forward and talking about those issues. This will be the last one, Jeff. Oh, it, I'm Jeff Colas, I'm San Francisco VA. I just got my 20-year pin. Good. So yeah. Thank you. Thank Good. you. <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to ask, how do we flip the narrative a little bit? Yeah. Because I, I, I think it's really important to have whistleblowers, and I think it's really important yeah. to think about this. But when we look at quality and safety metrics, we compete beautifully with uh, with private uh, mm -hmm. private hospitals. And also, there are an incredible number of, you know, sort of amazing things yeah. going on at the VA. Yeah. And we seem to never, that never seems to make it to the press. Yeah. How, how yeah. do we change that? Yeah. Well, um, for, first of all, I completely agree with that. Um, I think that as a private hospital CEO, I knew the things that I would deal with only in my office that nobody ever would know about because we'd keep it you know, under wraps, uh, become front page stories in the VA, become congressional hearing uh, you know, uh, content, and, um, and therefore the entire system gets labeled as having the problems that people think about. Um, and so getting the good news out, getting the good stories out, I think is a real challenge in this type of media environment because good news just doesn't seem to be of strong interest. So the only approach that I believe is is that you have to really go with full transparency. And one of the things that I did, again, my staff really tried to talk me out of it, was when Sean Spicer was um, press secretary, 
and pretty much didn't want to do press briefings either, I walked up to the White House press room and I essentially said, I want to talk about 13 major issues in the VA that if we don't fix are going to continue to be problems for decades. And people tried to talk me out of it because they said, all you're going to do is focus on the negative. And I said, no. Um, the only way that you're going to gain credibility with the press is if you tell them what the problems are, why you need to be focused attention on that. And then that gives you the ability to talk about as you begin to fix it and as you begin to get better. And I do believe that's a strategy. It's a longer term strategy than pitching a positive story. But I believe that we've lost the trust of the public and of our veteran community. And when you do that, you have to rebuild it. And I think, I think that's the way that we need to do it. I am concerned that many members of this administration have sort of walked away from the press, have hidden, aren't as open as I would like to see. Um, but, um, you know, and, you know, but I think that there is a path forward and that's part of what, you know, it's part of the reason why I wrote the book was because I wanted to show that there was a formula for fixing the VA and for addressing some of these issues, but you need to have consistency of it. You just can't one day be open to the press and then the next day not do any interviews, which is more what we're finding right now. David, thank you for visiting us and thank you for your leadership. It's really wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>